Chapter One Homecoming The first light of dawn colored Kirachu Island. Orion smiled. It is good, he thought to himself. Good indeed that he would return finally, return at daybreak. His strong legs quickened their stride along the rocky beach and up into the brambles. He could not remember a more perfect or fitting start to the day. As the sun's rays vanquished the remaining darkness, he felt the fullness of welcome to the kingdom of Dicentia. He had disembarked the Lady Delvina just beyond the harbour. Old Del, as her crew referred to her, was the grand ship of Orion's apprenticeship. As he rowed through the darkness toward the shore, he knew that no port, no land, no other place could ever rival the place his Dicentia held in his heart. The sun rose wide over the island, resurrecting all the colours and smells, towering trees, flowering fields, the song of the soaring birds and the chirping of insects. He felt his senses more alive than he could remember, as he soaked in every hue, every colour, every sound and every smell. Even as he took in his home, he recalled the dinner the captain had held in his honour the evening before. Two years of service, the captain intoned, raising his glass to the brave young man, knowing how much he would be missed. There were cheers and heartfelt hugs. Such men who worked the seas knew the value of a good man. Still, in the morning, when Orion left the ship, it was without ceremony, ending two years of combat training on land, followed by two years of servitude on the sea, was ceremony enough for Orion. He had been grateful for the knowledge gained and experience earned, but his overriding emotion was gladness, gladness that it was finally over. He traversed the narrow chain of peaks, that separated the coast from the fertile inland. It was autumn, and the fields had recently been harvested. Soon they would be ripe again, chest-high, nodding and billowing with rows of rice, wheat, oats, barley, millets, and corn. The fruit-trees in the orchards would again be heavy with succulent fruits. Ah, and such fruits! He knew the peaches and papayas, the thimbleberries and mulberries, the elderberries and huckleberries were already preserved in mason jars, soon to be baked into pies. He closed his eyes and imagined his own mother's speciality, peach and cloudberry cobbler, with some snowberries thrown in for good measure, and heaps of cinnamon, all covered with a drizzle of Dicentian basil. As he crested a hill, he paused. His heart was filled with emotion, as there, before him, he saw his boyhood village, just beyond the hills and forest. His face creased in a broad smile at the well-constructed cottages, formed from the chalk-white stone, taken from the faces of towering cliffs, and then wreathed in wisteria and finally thatched with golden bark, such cottages that had been passed down from generation to generation to generation, never seeming to age. His own cottage was perched on an ocean-ogling cliff. It had been built by his great-great-great-grandfather. Though Horion could not yet see his home, the thought of it urged him to quicken his steps. Following the grazing cattle, he crossed the Roshini River, whose waters irrigated tier upon tier of terraced gardens upon the slopes. And then, just like that, he was in his village, walking her cobblestoned roads and paths, through a labyrinth he knew as well as he knew the back of his own hand. He made his way into a dingle festooned with toadstools, fennels, Folashis, fig trees, 
mushrooms, molehills, rabbit holes, and wild flowers. He enjoyed the familiar twists and turns. Each boulder, each tree, had a memory attached to it. How many times had he run this enchanted path as a boy, more times than he could ever count. His years away had matured him, as they were meant to. But as the path ended, and his parents' cottage appeared before him, he felt himself transformed back into that young boy, sent away carrying a cloth sack containing little more than a change of clothes and a blunt blade, and the same sleeping squirrel it contained right now. How much lighter that sack felt upon the shoulder of a man! Rather than run to the cottage, Orion paused to allow his feeling of joy to wash over him. In his mind he could see his family's smiles. He could feel the warmth of their embrace. Then, as he walked along the path to the door, he wondered how he should greet his family. Should he knock and let them open the door, finding him returned on the doorstep? Should he push the door open and surprise them? Still unsure, as he approached the door, he raised his fist to knock, but hesitated. Then, with the anticipation of his father's pride, when he gazed upon a son transformed, Orion reached instead for the old iron latch and swung the oak door open. He was greeted with familiar warmth and sweet air. He was home. Orion breathed in the sumptuous smell of breakfast through the closed kitchen door. He could tell it was a feast of boiled strips of venison, and he guessed that there were dried gooseberries and plums to go with it. He made his way past the basil plant, sitting on the window sill. On the wall alongside it there hung the fine portrait of his mother. He smiled admiring the way the sunlight enhanced the already radiant beauty of her elegant pointed nose and her high cheekbones and forehead, features typical of Dysentian women. Orion walked slowly to the kitchen door, the floorboards creaking beneath his heavy boots. He twisted the wheaten knob and entered to see breakfast boiling over an unattended fire. Curious! Where was his mother? He remembered her to always be up at dawn, nursing the fire, sweeping morning dew from the doorstep. But though the breakfast boiled, the house was quiet. Suddenly a noise caused him to freeze. Someone honing a blade. His heart pounding, Orion unsheathed his own sword. He moved forward, cautiously. <laughs> He sighed in relief when he saw his mother and grandmother sharpening the kitchen knives and machetes. Hello, he called out, replacing his sword. The two women looked up and stared at him blankly, clearly shocked at the sight of a man who only a moment ago had been threatening them with a blade. Then, after a moment, recognition brought joy and surprise to their expressions. Orion, is it really you? Orion dropped his canvas sack to the stone floor, forgetting in his joy that his red squirrel Arthur was asleep within, and hurried to them, hugged them both at once. His little sister Gail, who had been sitting nearby playing with the doll, jumped up and threw her chubby arms around her big brother's legs, squeezing very tight. Orion broke away from the women and picked up the little girl. He spun her round and round while exclaiming, Oh, how I have missed you all! We have missed you too, Orion! So very much! His mother sobbed, overcome with emotion. She held him at arm's length and spoke with wonderment in her voice. You are so changed! You, you cannot possibly be the same little boy you left all those years ago! She peered more closely at him. But your eyes, your eyes are the same, Orion. For his part, 
Orion was hungry for news of his family and his village. You must tell me everything that has happened while I have been gone, mother and grandmother. Me too. <laughs> yes. You too, Gail. <laughs> he laughed as he put her down. Oh, Orion, Zania said, reaching up and stroking her son's cheek, astonished to feel stubble there. You were the one who has been on an adventure. You must tell us what you have been up to. Just then, Arthur the squirrel, who had been unceremoniously dumped on the hard stones, had made his way from the sack and was performing tricks for a very delighted gale. Orion smiled at his sister, knowing she would remain unaware of the squirrel's most special talent. Turning back to his mother and grandmother, he shared just some of what he had seen and done, careful in what he said, knowing that most of the last few years were not fit for women folk. He certainly did not think his refined mother would appreciate hearing any of the crude language he had learned aboard the old Dell, although the crew assured him that speaking that way was just part of being a man. Orion never took to it. Meanwhile, his grandmother, Rosalina, could not stop staring at this young man before her. <laughs> you, you remind me so much of my son, your father. You have certainly developed into a strong, tall, handsome young man, she told him. Speaking of my father, is he not at home? Orion said. Where is he? And, and where is Marlon? Just then, Footsteps came through the garden gate. Right here, my son, the deep voice stated. My word, it has been so long. His father, Joratan, came closer, carrying a brown leather satchel. Not far behind, Orion's little brother, Marlon, moved quickly to keep up. Orion, you, you grew so tall, Marlon cried out. Father, will I one day grow tall like Orion? <laughs> Yes, Marlon, his father chuckled. Then he turned to Orion. <laughs> Your little brother is right. You have grown. When you left, you were nothing more than a tiger cub. And now, he went on, <laughs> look at you, a man. Enough talk, Orion's mother declared. You must be starving. Let's eat. Soon the family was sitting together for the first time since the day Orion left. Not a day had gone by when during those four years of training Orion had not longed for his family. And now that he was home, it all felt like a dream. So, Orion, tell us, Zania said in a teasing voice, did you uh, meet any nice girls on your travels? I would not mind a daughter-in-law. Another pair of hands to help around the house. Orion's strong features coloured. <laughs> no, mother, no girl has stolen my heart as yet. Juratan chuckled. She would have to be beyond beautiful, Zania, to melt and steal my son's heart. Right, Orion? Orion smiled, but he kept his eyes on his plate. The talk might have been of romance, but his focus was on the delicious food his mother served. Despite his double helpings, Orion was the first to finish his meal. Zania tried to fill his plate a third time, but he gently refused. Finally, Juratan put his own utensils down. <laughs> that was fine cooking, my dears, he said to his wife and mother. Now you should go and rest. Orion and I will do the dishes. Rest, his wife smiled. Gail and Marlon were only too happy to leave the table. They were delighted by Arthur's antics and coaxed him back out to the garden, where he could entertain them some more. The two women knew that rest was not for them. There were other chores to attend to. However, as promised, Orion and his father washed the dishes. When Juratan finished drying the last bowl, Orion turned to his father and asked about the contents of the leather satchel. Juratan held his son's gaze for a long moment. Come, let us sit and talk, my son. 
Orion was eager to do just that. His father never ceased to amaze him with his wizardry, although Zania was not supposed to know he practised magic as much as he did. At least that had been the rule when Orion left. Juratan settled down in Rosalina's rocking chair. Orion brought a chair from the dining table and sat down in front of his father. For the first time Orion noticed dark circles under his father's eyes. His face did not bear a single wrinkle, but his hair showed some grey. Signs of age that had not been there when Orion left. Juratan lifted the case to his lap. He rested his strong hands on it. Orion, in this case, rests the key to the world's salvation from the tyranny of King Galaroth. Orion leaned forward. Rather than continue, Juratan leaned back. I fancy some tea. He looked at his son. Would you like some tea, my son? Uh, no, thank you, father, Orion said, surprised his father could follow the power of what he'd announced with something as mundane as putting on a kettle. But Juratan had his ways and his reasons. When he returned to the rocking chair, cradling a steaming cup of tea, he looked at his son. I suppose you had been gone no more than two years, Orion, when our clever king, King Hemlington, appointed me to create a blade of great power, and create it I did. Juratan lowered his voice to a whisper, as if there were ears that could hear the secret he was telling. It is called the Dissentian Blade. Wow! What a name! The Dissentian Blade. And just how powerful is the sword, father? Powerful beyond anything you can even begin to comprehend, my son. Even begin to comprehend. The fabled nine elements have been embedded into the sword. Orion felt a tremor as his father spoke. Father, what exactly are the nine elements? And if they're merely fabled... How did you know where to find them? Ha, ha, ha! Good questions, replied Joratan as he took a sip of tea. Savouring his tea, the older man looked at his son. The nine elements are the nine precious stones, and to the world they are a fable, but to the Dissentient dynasty they are very real. Our forefathers, warlocks of old, wrote in the archives proving that such magical jewels do exist. They also told of the truth that only a very powerful magnet can track them down. And after many years of sleepless nights of testing, I made a substance with a magnetic force never before known. I tested it by moulding it into a compass on the sword's hilt, and by God's grace, it detected nine force fields emanating from nine different places scattered throughout the world. Hmm, he sighed, that there were nine was sufficient evidence for me to prove the existence of the elements. And so I set out that it took nine months to gather them together and incorporate them into the sword steel also spoke to the symmetry of their power. Orion was impressed, yet still puzzled by his father's whispering. Father, why are you whispering? Is this still a secret? His father sighed deeply. Sadly, in today's world, nothing can be kept secret. Galaroth's fellow warlocks are always seeking anything that poses a threat to their lead. Once they discover something. He let the sword hang in the air, unspoken. If that is true, then whispering will do you no good, father. Orion frowned with some concern. Yes, and no. Do not forget that I too am a wizard, my son. I have a special whisper. Now Orion was confused. You... you cast a spell on yourself? No, not at all. 
his father said, but then stopped again mid-thought. Orion thought it was unusual for his father to be so cryptic, to make such little sense. Father, are you feeling all right? What you are telling me is very strange. After all, if you have the key to Galaroth's destruction, why have you not embarked on your quest to bring the demon down? The older man smiled ruefully. Hmm. Would that it were so simple. But the dissentient blade will not let me, Orion. Nothing is as it seems. What should be simple is often complex, and what appears complex is often easy. This time I am afraid I outdid myself. I created a magic far greater than myself. I did not foresee that once the nine elements are united and fused into the frame of the sword, they would create a force field so strong that the Dissentian blade would weigh as much as a loat tree. Therefore no ordinary man can possibly wield it. He sighed and shrugged his shoulders. I do not really know why this should be, but then I think it might have something to do with the gods. The gods? Yes, the gods. I fear I might have angered them by creating something so splendid. I think that the crown and trophy of the timeless kingdom himself, King Trinigan Apocalypse, wants to control the weapon's power by deciding who can wield it. The more he heard, the more troubled Orion grew. His father, recognising Orion's feelings, tried to comfort him. I want you to know that I have thought of every protection possible. I have encased the sword in this force-field-breaking satchel so it is easy to carry, as well as planting a paranormal virus of living cells inside the Dissentian blade, which will be activated if it is ever taken by force. That is, if Galaroth did manage to obtain the Dissentian blade before I could get it to King Hemlington, he lowered his eyes as the truth of what he was saying became clear. The sword would dissolve like salt in water. He shrugged his broad shoulders. Unfortunately, I cannot say the same for the elements. So where would the sword go? His father looked at him with a twinkle in his eye, a twinkle that spoke to what he considered a very wonderful outcome. It would rematerialize in a red portal behind King Hemlington's throne. Orion allowed this news to sink in before continuing. I heard during my travels that Galaroth has been relatively quiet recently, just trying to keep his disintegrating empire together. Is he still a threat to Dysentia? Always, my son, always. It is true that for many years Galaroth was tending to his crumbling kingdom. His cavalries were a shambles, staffed with lazy fat men who do not know how to handle a lance. His full-blown schizophrenic father, Gal Gangstinople, who is the Dragon King, and the head of the Galarian government and the Ministry of Monarchs, did not pass greatness down to his only son, as I promise to do for you. Juratan smiled at Orion, in a way that made him uneasy. You will not be passing anything down to me any time soon, father, Orion said, alarmed. You are still a strong man. Maybe, my son, but the world has changed since I was young. There was a time when the kingdom of Galeria was great. Too great, some said. The line of Galeria became spoiled. Growing ridiculously rich off their crown crop, they desired the fruits of ruling, without the duties that come along with it. A succession of sovereigns, best known as the Seven Sovereigns, wasted the land's liquid wealth and angered their people. Galgangstinople was just the worst of them. He exhausted his land's natural resources. <sighs> he shuddered. It took less than half a century for him to strip the forests of Galeria clean. He left impoverishing provinces in his wake. 
He enslaved the beaten down men and forced them to mine the highlands where the stone was pregnant with paragons. These rare jewels financed the kingdom's invasions into neighbouring realms, allowing him to establish an empire which boasts mountains sculpted into monolithic mansions, and like other men driven with such an insatiable lust, he was not satisfied with mere stone, sky, and steel. Oh, no. He dreamed of dragging the dales to the sky. And he did. He realized his mad dream with the aid of an ancient and once lost art that allowed him to conquer the clouds by commissioning cataracts of cream to stream through floating fields of flowers. Yes, he created extraordinary architectural feats, but at a pyrrhic cost. To my mind, he is nothing but scum, the epitome of the word egregious, for he spent his youth yielding to illicit gain by scheming, stealing, and engaging in everything foul. He was a man hated by many and loved by few. He commands no more respect from his own people than from those he had conquered and whose lands he had pillaged. This king was a malignant mastermind, Harion. His mundane mind earned him the name the very gore of greed, as if that's something to be proud of. Do you know how this criminal tried to strike a deal with Dicentia in order to feed his subjects and avoid an overthrow of his empire? Orion nodded. Yes, father. You told me that for many years now we have supplied the Galerians with a portion of our crops in exchange for a truce. What I never understood was why they did not just take over Dicentia, considering they outnumber us seven to one. His father nodded. Hmm, a wise observation. But why take on the responsibility of ruling when we were providing them with food for free? He is a paranoid despot, but Galgangstinople is also a practical man. Why waste his men's lives fighting us when the mere threat of the fight got him what he wanted. Orion shrugged. It does not seem fair to us, though. And as our king and all the kings before him have no ambition, if you ask me, our title should have been the Dicentian Empire by now, not some kingdom that submits to the threats of its adversaries. Empire? We are a long way from that. And fair? Of course it's not fair. One does not expect fairness now from his kind. One is grateful for whatever crumbs one receives. For us, an unfair treaty is better than none at all, but even that cannot be trusted. Now it seems Galaroth wants to go back on his father's promise to Dicentia and smash the treaty. Galaroth very well knows that the swelling number of his people means that soon Dicentia will not be able to supply the lands of Galeria with enough grain. Not enough grain means famine. And famine means civil war. Their godforsaken soil can supply them with rye, but for how long? Hmm? No one knows. It is clear that when Galgangstinople plunged from the tower and died due to drinking his weight in dragon's blood, he left his son quite a mess. No gold in the coffers, no decent army, a host of high-ranking officials waiting in the wings to seize the throne and overthrow the ruler. But Galaroth, Galaroth is standing tall and firm. Only several years older than you are now, he raised and trained an army of a hundred million men. What? A hundred million men? Yes. And this is just a fraction of his achievements, for, for this army he managed to tame and train ten 
million Maltrosians. What? Ten million Maltrosians? Orion exclaimed as he clutched the arms of his chair until the wood groaned with protest. Yes, ten million. He has proven his mettle in other ways as well, such as ploys, strategies, double-dealing, and even courage. He has made deals with neighbouring realms. He has addressed corruption, indemnified victims of interest, elevated the status of women by granting them suffrage, banished bureaucracy, nullified nepotism, introduced democracy, abolished slavery, lionised law, and instead of waging war, weaned warrior kings with wings and waterfalls of all sorts of blood. He made quite a name for himself. The Galleonic Council calls him King Charisma. Considering he conquered half the world with just two conversations, some senators argue that the wizard with words would be more apt. He is charismatic, but cunning as well. He has, essentially bought the world with little more than words. A good paradigm would be that he orchestrated a marvellous coup by stirring a storm in the Pangean Congress and ultimately bribed the vicegerent to butcher the king and his subjects under the veil of night. Yet this comes as no surprise, for Galaroth has been giving speeches since the age of six, he has the gift of intimacy with crowds and iciness with individuals. They say he grew skilled in the art of politics by osmosis, understanding as a child that mystery creates prestige, whereas familiarity breeds contempt, and above all, to diadem his demeanour, he has a fabled face. What does that mean? He is handsome, Horion, so handsome that his beauty commands the bees, and all sorts of beasts, to the degree that dragons dance for him, by performing airborne ballets, and little singing birds, butterflies and ladybirds, come and sit on his shoulders, and sing for him, while he feasts, or as a prelude to the prelude of the sovereign's speech. Father, how do you know so much about him? And other than the Pangean coup, how on earth did he conquer half the world with just a few words? I have read his life story, and you should too. It is wonderful, absolutely wonderful. I think it is the greatest book ever written. No, he said, pausing. It is second to the Book of the Gods, of course. And his conquest of other kingdoms comprises mainly of alliances, Horion. He forged a lot of alliances as love letters written by many monarchs and princesses from provinces all over the world flooded his court, asking for his hand in marriage, as they all fell madly in love with him. The most prominent love letter would be from the Queen of the Fairies, and as so many sovereigns eyed the throne next to Galaroth's, a war nearly broke out, as Galaroth had yet to choose a suitor. Spoilt for choice, and feeling the pressure in bringing peace, he declared a dance competition to settle who will bear his seed. However, after the competition, Galaroth announced that he was so impressed by all the royal dancing damsels that he will wed them all. Some declined, but the majority of the monarchs and princesses agreed. What is the title of his life story? Prince Prodigy titled because it was written when he was a prince. I am anxious to read King Charisma, the second instalment of his life story. The older man was thoughtful for a moment. He is nothing at all like his father, and not your typical truculent tyrant either. Perhaps that makes him even more dangerous, being a most magnetic, menacing monarch. He most likely takes after his empress mother, Lady Cassandra, who hails from a family of philosophers and pioneers. She is in exile now, for her motives and ingenuity, not to mention her insatiable thirst for supremacy, certainly threatened Galaroth. Rumour has it that knowing his father fell from the tower after downing a barrel of dragon's blood, he framed her for kicking him off. That, and accusing her of attempting to burn his stepsister, Princess Saraya, 
and his two half-brothers, Prince Colossus and Prince Galana, all three of whom fled the realm, their lives at risk. Juratan stood slowly to get some hot water off the fire and warm his tea. Before sitting down, he went to the shelf and took down a big black book which he handed to Orion. Even as he reached to receive Prince Prodigy, Orion's heart was engulfed by the fangs of envy. Evil or no, Galaroth had achieved a great deal in a short period of time, and having a face to go along with it gave the aura that Galaroth had it all. Weighing the tome in his hands, Orion could not help but look down on himself as a scrawny little farm boy, destined to plough cornfields for the rest of his life. Oh, but at least he was an ambitious farm boy, as he recalled with bitterness how delivering meaningful speeches, commanding armies, conquering countries, and making Dysentia into an empire had been his childhood dream. But for the enemy— to achieve this at such a tender age hurt him dearly. Jealousy coursed through him. He knew that the ways Galaroth employed were not favoured by the gods or man. But what he had achieved! Orion could not help but admire this man who managed to arouse adulation in a heart as honourable as Juratan's, something he desperately contended in doing. This made him curse Galaroth's charisma as he finally felt the venom of envy flood his heart. But suddenly something happened, quite extraordinary. A series of pleasurably portending stings pricked his jugular vein and made him gladly grimace as he found solace in a feeling flowing from his very gut. His mind clearly composed a message. Pummel the pangs of your contempt, for the gods are grooming you for far greater things than mere emperorship. The words faded from his mind, but the message remained. He was destined for greatness, but what form that greatness would take was unclear. Orion admitted to himself that, like all men, he was a devout believer in his earlier years, but had stopped believing in Lord Trinigan Apocalypse after seeing the mindless miseries of the world during his travels and training. Yet he welcomed anything that would kindle the fire of his faith again and cast off a dark cloud that hung over his head. A moment later he was focused on the matter at hand. So if this precocious yet pragmatic prodigy has been plotting like a deranged demagogue in his own dominion, it is certain that Dysent here will be rent asunder by this army of a hundred million men. Why, father? Are we even trying to keep it intact when it is meaningless? Juratan looked fondly at his son. You have become a man, my son. Not only have you grown handsome, but also judicious. King Hemlington is very virtuous. He believes that if you show an enemy mercy, the gods will show you mercy. Orion was shocked by this declaration. Is it that kind of thinking that makes a man a noble? He asked, his voice tinged with disgust. I say it is not nobility, but stupidity. We should be readying our army to fight. This folly, this so-called mercy, could jeopardize Dysentia's security. We should be burning the weeds before they bloom nettles and overwhelm us. And yes, this is what baffles me the most. If Galaroth has already bloomed a hundred million nettles, why hasn't he attacked us? And how long has it been, father? It has been two and a half years, Horion, and this morbid mystery has spawned a sickening suspense in the great halls of the Dysentian dynasty. And you propose that we should ready our army? Yes, we would have, if we even stood the slightest chance of dealing a glance. For forget our army. If all the armies of every nation were to march against his majesty, even then, he would blow them into oblivion with a single breath. His magic is mighty, but the Dysentian blade is mightier. And you should not underestimate the king of Dysentia, for he knows peace is not only our best situation, it is our smartest one right now, for even if Galaroth wasn't the wizard he is, and we were to assail the lands of Galeria head-on, 
we would have to mobilize the entire Dicentian Armada and confront the many perils posed by the Pandrian. Good men would die, men with families, friends and dreams, and all before even reaching the enemy. Furthermore, there's an old saying, when the lands of Galeria sneeze, her neighbours catch the cold. So, if our forces did set sail for the lands of Galeria, the lands of the fairies, Pangea, Orclea, Gaulin, as well as Traulion, would be sure to find out and make a move on us, while we were completely defenceless. Majestic our military might may be, my son, I fear we could not stand against such an onslaught. Orion began to say something, but his father hurried on. And if you are thinking that the treelings, gnomes, dwarfs, centaurs, humans and elves would lend their aid, then you are wrong. They would rather try to keep the peace than be responsible for starting a war. Like us, they would remain noble and stray to their swords only when directly attacked. He sighed. They share the sentiment of our motherland's main motto. It is better to die fighting for your fatherland than to die trying to conquer another's. Of course, if the worst does come to pass, I am sure everyone will feel differently about picking up arms. Until then, the situation remains what it is. Orion was thoughtful after listening to his father, but hardly comforted. I understand. We do nothing and wait to be slaughtered, for the sky to snow salt so we can perish like slugs and snails. Juratan made a face. You are right about one thing, Orion. We do nothing. We wait it out. The seeds have been sown, and when the fruits turn ripe, we strike. Our hope is that civil war and disease tear the country apart, but if Galaroth makes a move, we will be prepared to massacre him and his minions with one wipe, while keeping casualties to a minimum. Joratan concluded, again in a whisper. That's the plan, to let disease and internal strife weaken them and then strike? Orion asked, not sounding convinced. Father, Galaroth did not raise this ridiculous army just to admire it. Only the gods know if he's already set sail for our soil. Joratan said nothing, but his silence said something. And knowing his father intimately, Orion knew it meant for his children to surrender to whatever he says. So Orion swayed to Juratan's plan. It is always good to fight a weakened enemy than a stronger one, but why don't we speed up the process? Perhaps with an embargo? You mean go back on our word and void the treaty ourselves? Oh, no, Orion. How do you think history would treat us? What would our neighbours say? That coward King Hemlington starved the Galerians into submission. We would be no different than the Galerians then. And Dicentia is not a nation of tyranny. If we must fight, we fight to victory. However, we have never sought a fight, nor have we ever stooped to the level of our foes. This is a reputation that was hard to build, for we didn't build it on blood and betrayal, but forged it on the foundations of fidelity. An embargo would undermine Dicentia's moral standing. What's more, it was not something our generation, but our predecessors, who worked so hard to put on the world's political platform. And it seems to me that you fail to comprehend the chaos that entails with war. Believe me, I should know. I lived through one. And all I can say is that war is like a lamprey that bites little pieces of your soul until there is nothing left. Orion seemed chastised by his father's words, and thoroughly convinced. Yes, I see that you are right. Then he looked into his father's eyes. May I see the Dicentian blade, father? His father shook his head slowly. I'm afraid not. It would only put you in danger, for you would become one of the very few who could identify it by sight. We must keep it hidden until someone can brandish its true brunt. We, King Hemlington and I. He leaned closer to Orion. But if something were to happen to me, 
King Hemlington would need all the help he could get in finding someone strong enough to wield the Dissentian blade. Father, I told you, stop talking like that. We have many years to make up for. You are not going anywhere. I will not hear of it. Joratan smiled. Thank you, my dear son. Just then, the women folk came into the room. The day is a-wasting, Rosalina cried out, clapping her hands. You men will have plenty of time to catch up. Right now there is work to be done. It'll be winter soon, and we need to start preparing. Orion, you may be a grown man now, but there are still chores you have to do, she said, holding out a broom to him. Yes, Grandmother, Orion said, taking the broom. He began to sweep, attending to the mundane matters of the day. There was no more mention of the Dissentian blade. The brown satchel was put away. But it was not gone from his thoughts. He was determined that the next time he was alone with his father, he would learn 